And I wanted to say just a couple of quick things. Um, about source to sink transition. I'm not going to talk very much about it. The book's got a very nice explanation in it. But I want you to be thinking about the source to sink transition. So here, this is uh, radioactively labeled carbon. The part of the leaf that's black is importing radioactively labeled sugar into the leaf. So young leaves are complete importers. And the transition from being a sink to a source starts at the tip. And you should be able to give me some sort of an explanation of why it would start at the tip, what that tells you about how the leaf is developing and works towards the base of the leaf. And you should be thinking about the source to sink transition at the level of phloem unloading and phloem loading, because this is a key change in the development of a leaf. We've talked about mechanisms of phloem loading, and the mechanisms of phloem unloading are basically the same but in the opposite direction. There are symplastic and apoplastic unloading pathways. And the, the book describes the fact that most developing leaves are symplastic unloaders. So you should be thinking about what happens when a symplastic unloader becomes a symplastic loader, or a symplastic unloader becomes an apoplastic loader. There has to be different developmental sequence that's going on there. And you should be able to describe the sort of thing that's happening there. OK, I do also want to mention one other thing about phloem transport. And we're not really going to talk too much about it in this course. But if you're a plant pathologist, you think a lot about this. And this is the fact that there are other things can be transported in the phloem besides sugars and amino acids and water. Um, one of the very interesting that, things that's transported in the phloem is viral um, RNA or DNA. One mechanism by which viruses can um, systemically, that is, throughout the plant, cause an infection, is that viruses, or at least their nucleic acids, their genome, can be transported in the phloem. And a very clever experiment that demonstrated um, something interesting about this was to take the small fluorescent protein, GFP, green fluorescent protein, and transform Arabidopsis so that GFP was made in the companion cells of mature leaves. Okay, So you got this small protein that's being made in the companion cells. And it turns out it's small enough to fit through the plasmodesma, get into the phloem, and be transported. So you can see here where the GFP has been loaded primarily into the major veins of the leaf. Here is a young developing leaf where you're seeing the GFP being unloaded from the major veins of the developing leaf. So this tells you that GFP can be loaded into the phloem and transported through the phloem and unloaded into developing leaves. We know that there are many types of viruses whose genomes can also move around the same way. Genomes can be loaded into the phloem in, in uh, mature leaves and unloaded into developing leaves. And it's a very interesting question to think about what are the mechanisms by which things other than sucrose or raffinose and stachyose, things like that, can move through the phloem. And it's a question that we're still working on. One of the things we know is that the plasma desmata have what we call a size exclusion limit. Things bigger than a certain size can't fit through. You've already seen examples of that. The fact that sucrose can move symplastically from the mesophyll cells into the companion cells of symplastic phloem loaders, but that raffinose and stachyose, one or two uh, saccharides bigger, can't go back through those same plasma desmina, tells us that there's got to be a size exclusion limit. But we also know that things that are larger than the size exclusion limit, like viral genomes, can move through plasma desmina. So there's got to be some other mechanisms going on there as well. So it's a very hot area of research, a very interesting area of research, both from a physiological perspective, because there are signals in plants. We'll talk about florigen, the flowering hormone. Is, looks like it's probably a small messenger RNA 
That's got to be able to move through the plasma desma. There are other signaling molecules. We'll talk about a lot of different types of hormones that are moved through the phloem. Okay, so the, we need to think about what's happening in the phloem in a larger context than just moving the products of photosynthesis or just moving from sources to sinks. Because this movement from source to sink has been hijacked or being used by other transport mechanisms, whether it's viruses or whether it's signaling molecules in the plant. Those clearly are not generating the, you know, the RNA molecules that are being moved from the, where the viral infection happens to the developing leaves are not moving down by a gradient that's driven by the concentration of RNA molecules. They're being driven by the concentration of sugar molecules. Right? So you need to think about how these pre-existing gradients associated with metabolites in the plants can be used for other things to move around. Hemi. Yeah, well, I think the short answer is proteins. The plasma desma are lined with proteins, and there are, for example, we know there are these things called viral movement proteins that are involved in moving viral genomes through plasma desma. Okay, so it, the idea of thinking of the plasma desma as a static tube through which stuff can move from, the, from one cell to the next symplastically that's true for things that are smaller than the size exclusion limit. But for things that are larger than the size exclusion limit, there has to be other mechanisms. And as I said, we're just starting to sort out what some of those mechanisms are. Okay? Other questions before we move on to respiration? Good question. Who's the plant pathologist in here? No plant pathologist? I don't know the answer to that. It's a very good question. <clears throat> Would you expect that apoplastic, <coughs> excuse me, that apoplastic flow motors or apoplastic unloaders would be less susceptible to viral infection, systemic viral infection, than symplastic loaders or unloaders? Yeah, it seems like the answer would be yes. I don't know what the answer to it is. I'll see if I, I know plenty of the plant pathologists upstairs. I'll see if I can um, get the answer. But it would seem like that would be the case. Whether it is or not, I don't know. Remember that we're not even sure what the mechanism by which sucrose gets out of the cells into the apoplast so it can be apoplastically loaded. Right? So even for simple things like sucrose, we haven't got the whole story figured out yet. There are many, many aspects of phloem, phloem loading and phloem unloading that still remain a question. I can give you a long list of things to think about for exam questions. You know, here's a good one. Is there... Let's go back. Okay. So in symplastic phloem loading, is there a higher concentration of sugars in the companion cell in sieve element than there are in the neighboring cells that are producing the photosynthate in symplastic phloem loaders. Are they making a concentration gradient of sugars? Yeah, they are. Remember that they're using up the sucrose that's diffusing in to make raffinose and stachyose, which can't go back out through these plasmodesma. So we're concentrating sugars in here. So what's going to happen to the water pressure in the companion cell and sieve element of symplastic phloem loaders. It's going to go up, right? Why doesn't that water at the higher pressure go back through these plasma desmata? Wouldn't you expect if things can diffuse through there that bulk flow could make it move back in the other direction? We haven't got a clue how that works. It must be true because we know we can build up very high pressure, 10 times higher pressure in these cells than in this cell, and yet no water goes back through those plasma desmata, even though sucrose can move this way. And water is a lot smaller molecule than sucrose. Yeah, so if you think we've got plant physiology figured out, we don't. There's a lot of questions that we haven't figured out yet. Okay. So you got, if you 
decide you want to be a plant physiologist and get a PhD, there's plenty of good projects to work on. All right, let's move on to respiration. So based on um, the comments, whoops, sorry, the comments that you sent in on the reading for the reading assignment this morning, there's a lot of concerns about this chapter. And those are legitimate concerns because there's even more reactions and equations and stuff like that than there was in the photosynthesis chapter. And let me reiterate both in what I say now and what I say through today's lecture is that the main thing that you should be able to do for all these different groups of reactions, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, electron transport, the main thing that you need to know is what goes in and what goes out. Treat it like a black box. But the key thing to understanding how respiration works is understand how those reactions are coupled together. Glycolysis does not happen independently of the citric acid cycle and electron transport. You need to understand that coupling because that coupling, we'll see, is what governs the overall rates of these processes. They don't just happen. Cells don't just respire for the heck of it. They only respire when there's demand for energy, and we need to understand how that happens. Okay, so please do not get lost in all the intermediates and enzymes and stuff like that. Try to see the, B, see the big picture from the perspective of treat every one of these groups of reactions as a black box, but do understand what goes in, what goes out, how they're coupled, why they're coupled, and how that coupling leads to regulation. Okay? All right. So when we think about cellular respiration, we primarily think about energy production, right? When you think about making ATP and things like that in cells, this is associated with producing energy that all the other processes that the cell needs to do requires. If that's the only way you think about cellular respiration, you're going to be in trouble. Because there's one other very important thing that cellular respiration does. We got all these various coupled reactions here, but as we'll see in just a few minutes, many of these organic acids, triose phosphates, intermediates from the citric acid cycle, represent building blocks for other types of biological molecules. So when you're going to make lipids, or when you're going to make amino acids, or you're going to make nucleic acids, you take carbon, the cells take carbon out of this main vertical pathway here, and divert them off as carbon skeletons to make these other things. So I'm not sure if they organize it this way, but this vertical sequence of things here, and also the pentose phosphate pathway over there, are the primary sources for virtually every type of molecule that a cell makes. Okay, so we need to think about respiration not only in terms of energy production, but we need to think of it in terms of carbon skeletons, producing carbon skeletons for everything else the cell makes. Okay, what kind of uh, cells need mitochondria in a plant? Almost all cells? Give me an example of a cell that doesn't need mitochondria. Okay, xylem, but xylem's dead. Phloem? Do sieve elements have mitochondria in it? Uh, relatively few, but they're, remember, they have those sort of uh, companion cells with them that have plenty of mitochondria. Virtually all cells need mitochondria. How about mesophyll cells in a leaf? Does a mesophyll cell in a leaf need mitochondria? Why? Why does a mesophyll cell in a leaf, Anna, why does it need mitochondria? Give me an example. Okay. Um, yes, but that energy comes from photosynthetic electron transport. Well, there also has to be some maintenance. Say that again? There has to be some you know, maintenance of cells, you know, maintain some membrane. Okay. So 
Okay, so remember what we said about ATP and NADPH that's produced in the chloroplast? Where's it used? In the chloroplast. So even in the light, the normal cellular things that happen in the cytoplasm of photosynthetic cells need energy that comes from respiration. You need carbon skeletons that come from respiration. Any non-photosynthetic tissue needs respiration all the time. Right? So one of the most common places that introductory biology students screw up is by saying that leaves, leaves don't need mitochondria. They got photosynthesis. You have to view what's going on in the cytoplasm as being separate from the chloroplast. And the cytoplasm needs its own source of energy. Okay, so here's a good place to start thinking about the black boxes. So we got glycolysis happening up here in the cytoplasm, citric acid cycle happening in the mitochondria, electron transport happening in the mitochondria. And this is also showing you, at least partly, some of the things that couple them. So there's got to be coupling here between organic acids produced by glycolysis and going into the citric acid cycle. There's NADH that's produced by glycolysis and by the citric acid cycle that both go into electron transport. So that's the, the first level that you should really be thinking about what's going on. And let me just remind you, I, there's also a bunch of questions about NADH and NADPH. Let's just remind ourselves what's going on here. NADH and NADPH are basically the same molecule. One of them's got an extra phosphate group on it. And this basically functions as electron carriers. Where we have electron donors that re when you take electrons away from those donors, they reduce NAD or NADP to NADPH or NADH. And this doesn't accumulate, but it gives its electrons back to some electron acceptors. So NADPH, we talked about this as being something that's in the chloroplast, involved in photosynthesis. But it's also in the cytoplasm. But in the cytoplasm, NADPH is mainly involved in synthetic reactions. In reactions, for example, to make lipids, you have to reduce carbon from the level in sugars to make lipids. And NADPH plays a key role in that. Where NADH, it's only in the cytoplasm. There's no NADH in chloroplast. And this is mostly involved in energy. Not exclusively, but primarily. Okay, so these two compounds, although they basically do the same thing, they're an electron shuttle. We thought we've, you've come to accept the fact that ATP is an energy shuttle between energy producing reactions and energy consuming reactions. Don't treat NADH, NADPH any differently than that. They are shuttles for electrons between reactions that give up electrons and reactions that require electrons. And they're, they're not identical, but they're very similar in what they do. Okay? Okay, so if we think about what are the major substrates in cells for respiration, what's the... What's the carbon sources that respiration is working in. Let's start off, first of all, with a non-photosynthetic cell. A non-photosynthetic cell, ultimately most of the substrate is up there at the top, sucrose that's being imported from the photosynthetic cells. So sucrose enters into glycolysis and goes through this whole pathway to produce, as we'll see, a ton of ATP. So non-photosynthetic cells, sucrose is the main source, but non-photosynthetic cells they don't have chloroplasts, but they have other types of placids, and they can temporarily store starch. So starch, the breakdown products of starch, 
can also be substrates for respiration and for making carbon skeletons. We saw a good example of this in cam plants, where the starch in cam plants at night is the source of the phosphoenopyruvate that can be used for nighttime CO2 fixation. Right? So the starch can play an important role and is a, is a substrate for carbon skeletons and other reactions as well. In photosynthetic cells, it's a slightly different story because all the sucrose that photosynthetic cells are making is being exported. The main substrate in the daytime for, for, for respiration is triosphosphate that's being exported from the chloroplast. And this should immediately indicate to you something interesting is going on in photosynthetic cells that's quite different than non-photosynthetic cells. In photosynthetic cells, the main source of carbon in the daytime is triosphosphate. And that triosphosphate has got two directions it can go in the daytime. A lot of it is going to go to sucrose synthesis. But some of it has to go into respiration to make energy in the cytoplasm and make carbon skeletons in the cytoplasm. So there has to be some pretty interesting regulation going on up here in photosynthetic cells that you would expect to be quite different than the regulation that's present in non-photosynthetic cells. Because in non-photosynthetic cells, there's no big pool of triosphosphate that's pouring into the cytoplasm during the daytime. Okay? At night, photosynthetic and non-photosynthetic cells, pretty much the same. But in the daytime, photosynthetic cells have a big source of triosphosphate where non-photosynthetic cells don't. And we'll come back to this in just a minute. Okay, so the main pathway for carbon in this, starting off in either is sucrose or is triosphosphate, is through glycolysis in the citric acid cycle. Yep, and notice down here in the citric acid cycle, all the carbon that comes in, in sucrose or glucose or triosphosphate, comes out of the citric acid, acid cycle in the form of carbon dioxide. And all the reductant that's produced, all the NADH, goes into electron transport, which is ultimately made to use ATP. There's the big picture. That's the sort of thing I want you to be thinking about. Okay, and we'll talk in more detail about some of these things as we go through. Let me just also point out the overall efficiency of this process. So if we take the energy that's available in sucrose and add, add up all the energy that's available in the ATP that's made. And we'll see that the amount of ATP that's made is somewhat variable, but it's somewhere on the order of 32 to 36 ATPs per glucose that goes in, per six carbon sugar that goes into um, respiration. You get somewhere on the order of 35 ATPs out. What's the overall efficiency of this process in terms of energy? It's about 40%. Okay, so 40% of the energy that's available in hexose phosphates up there, things like glucose, ends up in ATP, and the rest of it ends up as heat. So here's a big reason why you don't want to have the Calvin cycle running at night. Because if you use up ATP and NADPH from, or NADH from, from respiration to make sugars, by the Calvin cycle, and then burn up the sugars to make the energy, your most of that energy is going, going to go off as heat. Right? So you don't want to have the Calvin cycle using up ATP and reductant at night. Okay, this pathway, glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, is common to all organisms. There are a few bizarre anaerobic organisms that lack some aspects of this. But in general, all organisms have it, which tells you that this is probably a pathway that was present in the earliest organisms. It's, the common, it's common both in terms of energy production, but probably even more important in those early organisms is the pathway for producing carbon skeletons. Right? Those early organisms got their energy in different mechanisms, but the fact that all of this is here is probably meant that this is the way those early organisms made the different types of compounds that they need. Okay, 
I want to say something very briefly. Uh, here's the picture of the way that, here's our sucrose down here to the citric acid cycle. And notice all the arrows that go off to production of different types of compounds, like fatty acids, uh, amino acids, uh, secondary products like flavonoids and alkaloids and lignans, nucleic acids to make ATP, to make RNA and DNA. Okay, so that all of the basic carbon structures that these more, more modified compounds are derived from come out of this key pathway of glycolysis in the citric acid cycle. Okay. All right, so let's start. I want to say something very briefly about starch breakdown. So we know that starch can be stored in chloroplasts. Starch can also be stored in other types of plastids and non-photosynthetic cells. And starch, starch um, breakdown, our perspective of what's going on in starch breakdown is, has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, we thought that basically everything that happened in starch breakdown produced triose phosphate. And triose phosphate was exported from the cell the same way it is in the daytime. We now know that that's present, but it's probably a minor pathway. The major pathway by which starches are broken down involve the formation of maltose, which is a disaccharide of glucose, or breaking that down to glucose itself. And then there are maltose and glucose transporters in the, in the chloroplast envelope to get those breakdown products out. So remember that starch is nothing but a big polymer of glucose. And the, end, the primary endpoints of starch breakdown in, in plastids is either the disaccharide to glucoses, which is maltose, or monosaccharide glucose. And those are exported by transporters. So that's not particularly surprising, because it means that the transporters that are, in, that are important in exporting sugars from the chloroplasts at night are different than the transporters that are involved in transporting sugars out in the daytime. And you should be able to rationalize why that makes sense. That would be a good exam question. Why does it make sense that there are different transporters for the breakdown products of glucose at nighttime compared to the transporter that's functioned to get the products of photosynthesis out of the chloroplast in the daytime? Okay, so let's turn our attention now to that main vertical pathway of glycolysis in the citric acid cycle. And as I said, I'm not going to go through every reaction and tell you about all the enzymes and stuff, but we want to think about how this fits into the overall picture. So here's sort of our vertical pathway up here, starting at the top with sucrose and down towards the bottom, we're going towards the citric acid cycle. And this is showing something that I told you about already, the fact that there are pools of hexose phosphates and triose phosphates that are very easily interconverted. So up here it's showing the interconversion of glucose 6-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate, and doesn't have it on, yeah, there it is, glucose 1-phosphate. So these are easily interconverted by enzymes that are called isomerases. They're just changing the, the way the carbons fit together. The same is true of triose phosphates. There's two main triose phosphates, um, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, that's triose phosphate that we talked about, and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. These two pools you've already seen in terms of photosynth photosynthesis and starch biosynthesis represent important pools of metabolites and sucrose biosynthesis as well. And it's not surprising that those same pools would be important in the breakdown of sucrose and glucose in respiration. Okay? So we have mechanisms by which these two pools couple to plastids. This pathway of triose phosphate is the main one for export in the daytime from photosynthetic plastids. This pathway is the main one that's involved in export of hexoses from, the, from chloroplasts at night or from amyloplasts storage plastids that are present in other types of non-photosynthetic cells. 
in the nighttime if it's a chloroplast or in any time if it's, a, if it's an amyloplast. Okay, so it's important to recognize that what's happening in the plastid and what's happening in the cytoplasm are very closely related to each other, and they're going to be re related by these transport mechanisms. Okay, so when we start off in, uh, up here at the top with sucrose, the first step involved in breaking down sucrose is probably one of the simplest ones. Uh, it's an enzyme called invertase that basically hydrolyzes the bond that links sucrose and, sorry, that links glucose and fructose together to produce two monosaccharides. One of the things that you want to notice that's important about glycolysis is if we starting up here with sucrose and converting it to glucose and fructose, to get down to this level of triose phosphates, we need to put energy in in the form of ATP. And this is something that confuses students a lot. Why does ATP need to be used in a reaction that overall produces a lot of ATP? And you know the answer to this. Yeah, it's sort of like activation energy, right? You're priming the pump is what they often call it, right? When you stick a phosphate onto things, you've already seen that that changes the properties of it. In this case, it makes it more reactive for the subsequent reactions that are going to happen. So although there is a net uptake of ATP early in cellular respiration, we're going to get a lot more ATP back later on. The other thing that you should notice is that these reactions in here might look familiar to you. So we've got glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, um, hexose sugars. These reactions here are the same reactions that are involved in starch biosynthesis in the chloroplast. In starch biosynthesis, obviously, they're going from triose phosphate towards the hexoses so you can make glucose and make starch. But this, they're the same enzymes. They run in the opposite direction, and obviously, they have to be regulated differently. So there's the same enzymes that are being produced in the chloroplasts and in the cytoplasm, but they function in catalyzing reactions that are going in opposite directions. Okay, let's look at the whole picture of... This is what we were looking at up before there, down to the level of triose phosphate. The remainder of glycolysis from triose phosphate is giving energy back. It's taking this triose phosphate and converting it into a three carbon acid, pyruvate. So the output, carbon output of glycolysis is pyruvic acid. But in the conversion of triose phosphate to pyruvate, we're making ATP and we're making NADH. So here's the first level at which energy is being retrieved by the cell, is in the oxidation of triose phosphates down to the level of pyruvate. And you know it's an oxidation, right? Because NA, sorry, NADH is being produced. You're taking electrons away from triose phosphate in the production of pyruvate. Okay. Ultimately, we're going to oxidize the glucose all the way to CO2. This is just the first step in it. Okay? So, an important thing that, that may not be apparent, well, it is apparent in this picture if you look carefully at it, and that is glycolysis needs NAD. It needs to have an input of NAD. And the NADH that is produced, as we talked about earlier, almost all of that goes into electron transport. If there's no oxygen present, in electron transport, the electrons go from NADH to oxygen. It's just the opposite of photosynthetic electron transport. In photosynthesis, we had water being oxidized to produce molecular oxygen and those electrons reducing NADP to NADPH. In respiratory electron transport, the electrons are being taken away from NADH and flowing downhill all the way to oxygen. If there's no oxygen, there's no mechanism to regenerate NAD. So in the first approximation, you would expect with no NAD, what's going to happen to glycolysis? It's going to stop, right? But there are mechanisms 
that permit glycolysis to continue in the absence of oxygen. And it's a process you already know. It's called fermentation. And let's bring this up here. Fermentation is a very old process. Because remember, oxygen in the atmosphere is a product of photosynthesis. Before photosynthesis was present, the organisms that lived lived in an entirely anaerobic environment. And reaction schemes like fermentation were the things that allowed organisms to continue to produce ATP in the absence of oxygen. So if we look at the overall process here, we have a net production of ATP and glycolysis. It's two ATPs per glucose that come in as the net. And if there's oxygen present, we have NAD being converted to NADH. Right? What we're going to see is, in fermentation, we have to do something with this NADH in order to be able to regenerate NAD so that glycolysis can continue. So if we can, a lot, if we can do something with this NADH, then we can, the cell can still make ATP. And that's, what, that's how the first organisms lived. By taking the pyruvate that comes from glycolysis and using the NADH from glycolysis to reduce pyruvate to some other compound. And there's two variations on this theme. The one that happens in our muscles, for example, is the reduction, direct reduction of pyruvate to form lactic acid. So you've probably heard people say that the burning feeling that you have when you exercise too hard is accumulation of lactic acid in your muscles. Well, anybody a exercise physiologist here? That's actually not true. But there is accumulation of lactic acid in your muscles when there's not enough oxygen present. When you're using your muscles, putting more demands on your muscles than your blood can deliver oxygen to them, your muscles turn anaerobic and they produce lactic acid. Right? So they're using up the NADH from glycolysis to reduce pyruvate to lactic acid. But the burning feeling is not lactic acid. But it's not lactic acid, no. The other one, well, being college students, most of you are probably familiar with this process by which pyruvate is converted into the end product, ethanol. Now that's very important because the CO2 released is one of the things that makes bread rise. Right? You're all familiar with making bread, right? Yeah, okay. I know you're also familiar with using the ethanol to make beer and wine and those sorts of things. This is a product that, a process that, the main place we think about it is in yeast. Yeast that we use for leavening in breads and yeast that we use for ethanol production when we're making um, alcoholic beverages. Okay? But both of them are accomplishing the same thing. Using up the NADH, regenerating NAD, so that glycolysis continue. Is there energy available in ethanol or lactic acid? Is there any useful energy available in those compounds? How about for you? What do you do with the lactic acid that you produce in your muscles under anaerobic conditions? Does that just accumulate in your muscles forever? That's correct. So in the absence of oxygen, these are dead-end metabolites. They accumulate. So in your muscles, lactic acid accumulates. In flooded roots of plants, we are, remember oxygen diffuses quickly through soil when there's air in it, but when the soil is flooded, oxygen diffuses much more slowly. The roots go anaerobic, and they produce ethanol. And the plants, the ethanol actually turns out to be a small molecule. It can move easily through membranes. It just gets, goes out into the soil. If you dig up the roots of flooded plants and smell it, you'll smell the ethanol. But if oxygen comes back again, then the ethanol lactic acid can go back into regular metabolism and be completely metabolized and get a whole bunch of ATP out of it. So if we look at what's happening, starting with sucrose, under conditions of fermentation, we get a net, we put in two ATPs, we get out four ATPs, that's a net of two ATPs. 
and all the NADH that's produced is used up in fermentation. So that means we get two ATP per glucose that went in there. How many ATP did I say you get if we have normal aerobic respiration? 35 or so? Yeah, so it's more than 10 times more efficient to do aerobic respiration than to do anaerobic respiration. So if I have an organism that has, that whose metabolic processes stay at the same rate, but we switch it from aerobic to anaerobic respiration, what's going to happen to its rate of glucose utilization? It, the metabolism of the organism stays the same, but we switch it from aerobic respiration to anaerobic respiration. What's going to happen to the rate of glucose utilization? Explain your answer. Well, you're, you got it almost right, except for you're backwards. If the energy demand stays the same, we get two ATPs per glucose in, in uh, fermentation and 35 in aerobic respiration. What's going to happen to the rate of glucose utilization if the energy demand of the cell stays the same? It's going to go way up. It's got to make the same amount of ATP, but it can only make two ATP per glucose in fermentation. Wait, did you say it goes from aerobic to anaerobic? It goes from aerobic to anaerobic. Oh, I did? Okay, well, that's my fault. Sorry. Okay, so going from aerobic to anaerobic, if the demand for energy stays the same, the demand for glucose is going to go way up because it can't make as much. And this becomes important for any of you that are... Um, post-harvest physiologists. If you store fruit, you have to be very careful about how you store fruit because if you get the oxygen concentration too low inside the fruit, the cellular processes, if those cells go anaerobic, they burn up their sugars 10 times faster under anaerobic conditions than they do aerobic. And typically fruits, were, we like fruits because they have sugar stored in them. They're, the sugars are the desirable part about them. So you have to be very careful about how you store fruits. Okay. Okay, one other thing I want to mention here is that this process can in fact be run in the opposite direction in certain types of tissues. It's called gluconeogenesis. It's production of glucose or production of intermediates in this pathway and that typically happens in seeds and storage organs where starch is not what's stored. So for example, imagine a seed where most of the storage happens as oils and fats. We got to get those carbons from oils and fats back into this pathway so that those cells can make energy and make carbon skeletons, right? And so the reverse of this process, which doesn't use ex all the same enzymes, but it uses many of the same enzymes, is important in cells where carbon is stored in non-carbohydrate form. So there are some, some um, storage organs that store things as oils and fats, other ones that stores them as proteins, those are the ones in which gluconeogenesis is going to be important because you've got to get those things back into carbon metabolism, back into the central pathways so that the, the, the oils can be converted into nucleic acids and amino acids and things like that. Okay? All right. So if we... Stick with the black box idea. We have glycolysis. What comes in is glucose. 
What comes out in terms of carbon? Pyruvate. So this is six carbons. In pyruvate, this is two, three carbons. Any CO2 production? Okay. We also need um, let's just look at the net reaction. We need ATP, ADP, and phosphate. We need two, a net of two of those. And we need two NAD plus. And those come out as ATP and NADH. So thinking about it this way, one of the things that immediately jumps, should jump out at you is there's no carbon dioxide in here and no oxygen in here. Remember, the oxygen is coming in at the last step to oxidize the NADH. So glycolysis does not have any direct effect of oxygen. Is there an indirect effect of oxygen? Absolutely, because oxygen is required to oxidize the NADH back to NAD that glycolysis needs as an electron acceptor. Okay? That's the level I want you to think about stuff. Okay, let's move on to the citric acid cycle. Glycolysis has all been in the cytoplasm. All the enzymes in glycolysis are just floating around free in the cytoplasm. When we get to the citric acid cycle, we have to move from the cytoplasm into the mitochondria, in fact, into the matrix of the mitochondria, into this area that's inside the inner membrane. That's where all the enzymes associated with the citric acid cycle happen. So interesting, it's a cycle, right? It's sort of like the Calvin cycle. What's coming in is three carbon acids, pyruvate, and what's coming out is one, two, three carbon dioxides. So this is the sequential oxidation of pyruvic acid to CO2 and producing lots of NADH. FADH2 is just a variation on NADH. It's just another electron carrier. So we're getting a lot of reductant that's being produced here. So if we treat the citric acid cycle the same way, we have pyruvate coming in. All right, and that's uh, three carbons. And what's coming out is CO2, and there must be three of those. Right? Per pyruvate it comes in. And associated with this, we have, well, let's do it this way. We have lots of NAD being converted to NADH. And we also have a little ADP being converted to ATP. Not much. One per pyruvate that comes in down here in this step. So does the citric acid cycle depend upon glycolysis? Is there any link between the citric acid cycle and glycolysis? What is it? Pyruvate, right? How about NADH or NAD? Any link between the citric acid cycle and glycolysis? Not a very strong one. I mean, they both need NAD, and they both produce NADH. So that doesn't tie them together very much. Same with AD, sorry, ADP and ATP. Okay, one important thing I want to say about this, well, two things. One, a lot of these compounds are the starting place for the biosynthesis of other things. So, for example, many amino acids are synthesized from this five-carbon intermediate. So a lot of carbon gets taken out of this cycle in an average cell. About one out of 16 carbons goes out this way to make amino acids. What does that mean about this four-carbon acid here gets, takes a two-carbon remnant, pyruvate loses one CO2, giving a two-carbon acetyl group. This four plus six gives you, sorry, four plus two gives you six carbons that then go around five, four, and so on. What happens if we're taking a lot of carbon out of here? 
what happens to the amount of this oxaloacetate? Goes down, right? But we know that under normal circumstances, you've got to get a lot of carbon out there to be able to make proteins, right? So how does the citric acid cycle keep going? Well, you know the answer to this. You just haven't seen it yet. And that is the enzyme pepcarboxylase. Remember I said pepcarboxylase was a key enzyme in every cell, but it has nothing to do with photosynthesis? What pepcarboxylase does is take PEP, which is an intermediate in glycolysis, and adds bicarbonate in to produce oxaloacetate. Exactly the same reaction that happens in C4 plants. But in this case, what pepcarboxylase is doing is regenerating this four carbon acceptor when a lot of carbon is being shuttled out to make other intermediates. So you correctly pointed out that if we're taking carbon out here, we're not making enough of this to keep the cycle going. Pepcarboxylase is what makes more of the oxaloacetate acceptor so that the cycle can keep going. So it's absolutely essential if you knock out pepcarboxylase in any organism, that organism is dead because it must be able to keep this cycle going while at the same time taking out intermediates to make different types of protein, amino acids, and things like that. Okay? So pepcarboxylase plays a very important role in this overall process. Okay. So this is the level, again, that I want you to think about this. Don't worry about all the details and stuff. That's not important. Thinking about what's going in, what's going out, and how they're coupled is what's important. That make this a little easier? No, it's not making it easier. It should. I mean, if you're taking biochemistry, you'll learn all these guys. You'll have to you'll memorize all the intermediates in, in order and all the enzymes that, that catalyze these reactions. I don't care that you know that. That's not what's important. What's important is you understand what's happening to the carbon and why it's being oxidized or reduced, what's coupling them together. Okay? Leaping right along to electron transport. So now we've got NADH, the electrons that were taken away from glucose in the conversion to pyruvate. We got lots more NADH in the oxidation of pyruvate to CO2. The last step of this process, there's no more carbon, right? All the carbon's gone. We've oxidized all the carbon to the level of CO2. Now all those electrons that started off in glucose are in NADH. And the last step of respiration is to get the energy out of those electrons. Think about it. In photosynthesis, we had to put a lot of energy in to convert water, take the electrons away from water, and give them to to NADP to make NADPH. In respiratory electron transport, we've got the NADH and we're going to give the electrons back to oxygen and gather all that energy that can be used to make ATP. Okay? So the electron transport chain, in, a, in the simplest sense, is the reverse of photosynthetic electron transport. We're starting over here with inputs of NADH and at the end, we're reducing oxygen to water. And what happens in between there is another big thing of alphabet soup. And the thing that you need to recognize that's going on in this alphabet soup is just the same as what was happening in photosynthetic electron transport. That is, as electrons move from NADH through this electron transport chain to reduce oxygen to water, there is an obligate coupling to proton transport across the inner mitochondrial membrane. So we have protons being transported across the membrane associated with these various electron transport components. And that proton gradient is then being used by the exact same enzyme, well, let's say very similar enzyme for ATP synthesis. So one of the things I want you to be able to do, the sort of question I'm almost certain to ask you something about on an exam is being able to compare what's going on in photosynthetic and respiratory electron transport. What's similar and what's different? Most of it is very similar. The major difference is they're going in opposite directions. 
One requires an input of energy, obviously photosynthesis, and you know how that happens now. The other goes in the opposite. That energy now becomes available. That energy is made into a proton gradient, which is then used to synthesize ATP by the same mechanism that it happens in chloroplasts. Okay. So a couple things that are different between mitochondria and chloroplasts. Well, let's, first of all, let's, let's look, at, look at what's the same. Remember in chloroplasts we had that thing plastoquinone that carried electrons between photosystem II and a cytochrome complex? There is a similar molecule in mitochondria called ubiquinone. It carries electrons to, here it is, the cytochrome BC1 complex. In chloroplasts, it was the cytochrome BF complex. Basically does the same thing. And remember, from the cytochrome complex to photosystem one, there was that little soluble protein, plastocyanin. In mitochondria, it's cytochrome C. So from here to here, electron transport in mitochondria and chloroplasts is virtually the same. In fact, if you look at photosynthetic prokaryotes, Remember, prokaryotes have no internal membrane systems. They don't have any chloroplasts or mitochondria. The only membrane they have to do anything with is the plasma membrane. If you look at photosynthetic prokaryotes, this part of the electron transport chain is shared by photosynthesis and respiration. There's nothing separate. They share that same thing. It's just that photosynthesis puts photosystem two over here and puts photosystem one over here. In mitochondria, or in respiration, they use an NADH oxidase and cytochrome oxidase at the end. Okay. So it's got to be different complexes somewhere in here because there's no light reactions in respiratory electron transport. Okay, so those are the similar things. What are some of the things that are different? Obviously, one of the things that are different is that there's complexes that are present in mitochondria that aren't present in chloroplasts. The NADH oxidase and cytochrome oxidase, the beginning of the electron transport chain and the end of the electron transport chain, are unique to mitochondria. There's also another complex here, complex two, that succinate conversion to fumarate was one of the reactions in the citric acid cycle. It directly puts electrons into the electron transport chain. And one of the common questions that people ask about electron transport is, if you put electrons in NADH, you get more ATP than if you put electrons in from succinate. Why? Yeah, yeah. So if you put the in, in electrons here, there's only a couple places where protons couple to electron transport. If you put electrons in from here from NADH, you get more protons. Remember, proton gradient is what generates the ATP. So anything that produces more protons per electron that moves along here will make more ATP. That's the simple answer. Yeah. You're counting up the pro no, don't count this one because these protons are moving in the opposite direction. Right? Yep. But how many NADH do we make per glucose? Yeah, don't count them all. There's a lot. There's a lot. Like eight or something like that. Three and then one third eighty out of one glucose. Say that again. We said we get thirty-eight, but the numbers. No, but how many? How many of these guys do we get per glucose? We get one from glycolysis. I don't know the answer to it. I'm expecting to know the stoichiometry. We get one, two, three, four, five from the citric acid cycle. Then that's five per three carbon sugar. So for glucose, that's 10, right? So we multiply what you got, your stoichiometry here, 10 of these per glucose. 
So that means we're getting that for a 10 protons per glucose. We're getting 100 per glucose. Oh, this number is okay. These numbers are per the NADH the that goes in, okay? So now you can see where all the ATP comes from. It can make a lot of big proton grading. So per glucose, we should be able to account for you know, approximately 30 ATPs being made from this. Right? From here across? Yeah. Yeah, OK. So if an electron is moving from a good donor to a good acceptor, that's energetically favorable. That's got a negative delta G, right? Have we seen examples of where ATP hydrolysis, for example, that has a negative delta G, can be coupled into a process that has a positive delta G to make that reaction work? Yeah, we've seen several examples of it. And this is just a different example. Here, electron transport that is favorable, that has a negative delta G, is being coupled to proton transport that has a positive delta G. What's the overall delta G have to be for this to happen? It's got to be negative, right? So the energy available from electron transport has to be greater than the energy requirement for proton transport. And if you're asking at the molecular level, how does that happen? It's all in the protein. As the electron moves through the protein from various carriers in the protein, some things get protonated, some things get deprotonated. There's a net movement of protons across the membrane. It's really cool. We understand, I think, for all of those complexes, how the proton transport happens. We, you know, at the molecular level, this amino acid binds a, a proton. This amino acid gives up a proton. This amino acids are involved in passing a proton along. Because there has to be a net transport of protein, protons across the membrane. We know how that happens. But it's all the protein that does it. Remember the question on the last exam about coupling? This is no different. This is coupling the energy that's available from electron transport, negative delta G, to moving protons against their electrochemical gradient, positive delta G. And then the energy of that proton gradient is being used for ATP synthesis. OK. So let's step back for a second. Here's our overall process of we should really have glucose up there at the very top. And we don't have in the electron transport chain the oxygen down here at the bottom. This is mostly keeping track of other things related to regulation. Would you expect that in any organism the production of ATP in this overall process, the, the supply of ATP regulates the demand for ATP, or is it the demand of ATP that regulates the supply? Demand regulates supply. Why do you say that? <laughs> let's, let, let's carry that makes sense a little bit further. It makes sense because, why? Anybody else? Why does it make sense that demand regulates supply rather than the other way around? Anna? If there's no demand, why would, you know, why would the cells that you know, in the does, does making ATP use up cellular energy? Of course it does. Yeah. You're taking glucose, and you're oxidizing, and you're actually throwing away 60% of that energy, right? This heat. Yeah, so that's not something the cell wants to play around with. Cells don't just waste energy. But there's a more important reason that you're forgetting about. the role that the ATP plays in the cell? Where does the energy come from to do this? To convert ADP to ATP? Respiration, right? 
chloroplasts. It could be photosynthesis. So when respiration is going on, does ATP accumulate? If the cell were doing respiration but there was no demand for energy, what would happen? ATP would accumulate, but what would happen with this? It'd be low. And what would happen to the rate of respiration if this is low? It's got to slow down. It's no different than what we talked about, the coupling between the light and dark reactions. Because this energy has to be used up for cellular processes. Because the amount of ATP and ADP is relatively small, you cannot have respiration going more than the demand for cellular processes. Because if you did, ATP would accumulate and ADP would become limiting and respiration would slow down. So even if there was no other regulation, the amount of respiration has to be controlled by the demand for ATP simply because of this coupling. If that was the only thing that happened in, in, photo, or in uh, respiration to regulate it, it would be easy. But of course it's not. There are many other things going on. But you can see the basic picture. ADP. When ADP accumulates, the green line represents activation. When ADP accumulates, it goes up and it activates one of the early enzymes in glycolysis. Why does this make sense? Why, when ADP is high, do you want to turn on glycolysis? Why, when ADP is high, do you want to turn on glycolysis? How about you, James? Why would it make sense? Under what conditions would ADP be high? Yeah, when you're using a lot of ATP, right? So if the demand is high, you're using up a lot of ATP. So why would you then, why would you want ADP then to turn on glycolysis? To make more ATP, right? It's demand regulating supply. So this arrow right here is certainly one of the most important ones in regulation of glycolysis. There's a bunch of other things here that, you know, that contribute. But this one is extremely important. But does that green arrow mean that ADP is low or that the concentration No, this means when ADP high. is high. Or does it mean that the concentration of phosphate is getting Oh, sorry. You're just coming from phosphate or ADP? Well, it doesn't really make a difference. I'm pretty sure it's ADP that's the regulator, not phosphate. But yeah. It's not a distinction that I will ask you to make. When ADP is high, that enzyme gets turned on. When ADP is low, when demand is low, it shuts off that enzyme. That's the key regulation in respiration that I want you to understand. So again, it's coupling, but it's coupling at the level that we're talking about here. When demand is high, ADP will be higher. Turn on respiration to make more ATP. When ADP is low, demand is low, turn off respiration. That should make sense to you. OK. Uh, I want to finish with one thing that is, uh, ties us back to what we talked about at the beginning of the lecture. And that is the role that the interconversion of triose phosphates and hexose phosphates plays in the fact that you could be taking triose phosphates from the chloroplast in photosynthetic cells. Mostly, you want to go that way, right? You want to make sucrose. But some of it has to go this way. How is that bifurcation of triose phosphate coming out of the chloroplast controlled? And there's a section, and it's not in the respiration chapter. It's mentioned in the respiration chapter, but the first part, first discussion of it is back in the carbon metabolism chapter of photosynthesis. And these are the reactions that are involved. So we have triose phosphates coming out of the chloroplast. 
and we have two possible mechanisms, directions for it to go. It can go towards sucrose synthesis. We would expect most of it to go in that direction, which in fact was sort of backwards glycolysis, right? Glycolysis, we start with sucrose and we go that way. Right? So the main thing that's happening in photosynthetic cells is triosphosphate is coming out and things are going in this direction as opposed to going towards glycolysis. Which enzyme in this picture would you expect to be active in cells where sucrose synthesis is going on? This guy, right? Because it's driving the reaction in this direction. And these guys would be relatively inactive. If there was high demand for energy in the cell, then you would expect that this reaction would be off and these guys would be on. So it's these reactions that interconvert hexose phosphates and triose phosphates that play the key role in that regulation. And the key role that does that regulation is a very interesting compound. The compound that regulates, that turns on and turns off these enzymes is fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Notice that the intermediate between the hexose and the triose phosphates is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. This is not a metabolite. This is a regulatory molecule that when it's present, it activates carbon flow towards glycolysis and inhibits carbon flow towards sucrose. When it's low, it's, it has the opposite effect. So one of the things that you should be able to do, should be relatively easy, is tell me what's the day-night level of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, right? What would you expect the day-night levels of it to be under normal conditions? In the daytime, we expect most of the stuff's going to go this way, and at nighttime, we expect most of the stuff's going to go that way. So you should be able to tell me whether fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is high or low in the daytime or night. You should be able to tell me how this ends these enzymes that regulate the formation and breakdown of 2,6-bisphosphate, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, what sorts of things might regulate them. Because that has to be tied to the balance of demand for sucrose synthesis versus respiration. So this area between the hexose phosphates and the triose phosphates, these enzymes right here, are the key ones that are involved in regulating carbon flow towards sucrose versus respiration. And you should be able to, I don't want all the gory details, but you need to be able to understand, first of all, why this regulation is important there, and also how it's regulated in the most general sense. What's the role that, that fructose 2,6-bisphosphate plays in, plays in that regulation? Okay?